we are starting now with talking about intra-abdominal pressure. So if we talk about intra-abdominal pressure and interactions of intra-abdominal pressure with respirations, we first have to become aware that if we are talking about intra-abdominal pressure, we have to define what intra-abdominal pressure really means. And let's work from my friend Manu Malbrain. He said, well, there is a place where we can talk about normal abdominal pressure, and there is a place where we talk about abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment. And the changes of pressure in the abdom abdominal cavity resemble very, very much the changes of pressure, or of intracranial pressure, which means you get an increase, and all of a sudden this increase becomes exponential. Now that's the development of normal intra-abdominal pressure starting from abdominal hypertension and going up to the abdominal compartment syndrome. So first of all, I have to give you some definitions because last year in December there was the second World Congress on intra-abdominal hypertension. And one of these definitions, the intra-abdominal pressure is the pressure concealed within the abdominal cavity and the abdominal pressure varies with respiration. That's something which is important and we see later on why this is true. The normal intra-abdominal pressure is around five. Well, after breakfast, it might be even higher and sitting even increases as I will show you later on your abdominal pressure as well. But it might be 10 to 15 in chronic conditions like obesity or pregnancy, which is not a state of um, any kind of illness. So the intra-abdominal hypertension is called a state when the intra-abdominal pressure is above 12 millimeters of mercury. It, this can be caused either acute or chronically. So how often does an increase in intra-abdominal pressure really occur in a community or in a group of patients that are into an ICU without that they are suspected to have real increase in intra-abdominal pressure. And this is a prevalent study in several European countries, as you can just see from the authors. And there is a remarkable group of patients having intra-abdominal pressure suspected to be intra-abdominal hypertension in the range between 12 and 16. And it's the largest group of patients in this prevalence study. And again, these patients have never ever been before suspected to have an increase intra-abdominal pressure. So we can look into details and you see this is in total patient and even in medical patients, there are no surgical problems, no abdominal pressure. There is a remarkable amount of patients having increased intra-abdominal pressure. So I quickly just summarize, that's the definition of gradings, so grade one, intra-abdominal hypertension between 12 and 15, grade 2, 16 to 20, 21 to 25, and grade, uh, <coughs> uh, grade 4 is greater than 25. So we learn now in between that probably not the degree of intra-abdominal hypertension, but much more the abdominal perfusion pressure, at least with regard to the abdominal organs, is the most important part of the deal. Again, this is a distribution in another study from Manu Malbain's group and just to show you that there is a relation between outcome of the patients and increased intra-abdominal hypertension. This is very closely related, no intra-abdominal hypertension and mortality over a 28-day period. You see there is a, in a marked increase in uh, mortality if you have patients with increased intra-abdominal hypertension. You can just skip that. And it's closely related to the number of organ failures. So as higher your abdominal pressure is, as more organ failures you see. And <coughs> it's also related to the, uh, to the SEP score and other organ failure scores. So my first question I would like to discuss with you, going then to discuss with you later on the influence of increased intra-abdominal pressure on respiratory function is it rational to pay attention even at low values of intra-abdominal hypertension? Well, this is a nice study. It has performed, been performed by Schwarte and colleagues just for a totally different reason. They were looking for the in effect of laparoscopic intra-abdominal pressure increases. 
and they used flow <coughs> flow, uh, laser flow spectroscopy to measure, and they could easily show that by just increasing to 8 and to 12 millimeters of mercury, the intra-abdominal pressure, there was a marked increase in the oxygenation of the, organ uh, of the uh, abdominal organs. And uh, <coughs> if you just have a look at the, at the changes per se, so at the time of 8 and 12 of intra-abdominal pressure, there was no change in perfusion pressure, there was no change in heart rate, and there was no change in the SpO2, which means the reduction of flow was only caused by the increase of intra-abdominal pressure. So this is a, a nice study by, by Ms. Anderson that has been performed in laparoscopic patients and the, uh, these use, uh, are used now to look at the CT scanning. I don't want to bother you with the CT scanning, but just an interesting observation. So by getting a pneumoperitoneum, you observe, of course, the pneumoperitoneum while looking at the slices. So this is a slice without increased intra-abdominal pressure. This is with increased uh, abdominal pressure. Liver, this L marks the liver. And now she was looking <coughs> for the amount of atelectasis. Again, we are below 15 millimeters of mercury abdominal pressure. And you see before and after. So in all these patients, there is a marked increase of atelectasis. And as well, if you look for the distribution of gas and tissue, you get an increase of tissue. And you get at the same time a reduction in gas that you can prove in the CT scan. So even low intra-abdominal pressures obviously have a marked influence on the formation of atelectasis, especially in the, diaph in the, in the parts of the um, lung which are very close to the diaphragm. So now the question is, if there is increased intra-abdominal pressure and we combine intra-abdominal pressure with another incident, for example with acute hemorrhage, is intra-abdominal pressure with a second teeth able to cause lung injury? So this is um, a very elegant mo a mo animal model, and you see there are different states. So at abdominal compression syndrome, hemorrhagic shock, and the combination of both. I don't want to go into details, but I just want to show you in a few things. This is now systemic cir circulation. You get the marked increase of TNF-alpha and of EL8, by just combining shock and intra-abdominal compartment, but we are especially interested in the lungs. So we look now for the bronchial alveolar lavage. And as you can see, if you combine and look for myeloperoxidase um, <coughs> and, and the poly polymorphic nuclear, you see there is a marked increase if you combine increased intra-abdominal pressure together with another second heat, which means um, hemorrhagic shock. So the pathophysiology of increased ERP is, is, uh, can be shown in nearly every organ or organ system. And we are now focusing not on these, but we are focusing on the pathophysiology regarded to, with regard to um, the pulmonary system. So that are, there are some changes which ha are, have been drawn here, and I would like to focus now why this is true. So, <coughs> first of all, this is an old study which has been performed in pigs, and it shows you the <coughs> increase of pleural pressure in animals with, with and without um, open chest. So, you see, if the chest is closed, as you increase intra-abdominal pressure, you get a marked increase in, <coughs> in the pleural pressure. And this is consecutively followed by an increase in central venous pressure. So, first message is... Don't trust your central venous pressure if the abdominal pressure is increased. So this has not only been shown for the central venous pressure, but also by Malbrine and by Hering for the, <coughs> for the pulmonary capillary occlusion pressure. Though there is a marked change if you increase intra-abdominal pressure if you look for the PCVP. So don't trust in the PCVP if your abdominal pressure is increased. So what about other organs? What about extravascular lung water? Over time, 24 hours, this is a nicely performed study by Töns and Schachtuch. 
um, from Aachen, showing over 24 hours with an increase of the inner abdominal pressure up to 30, you get an increase of extra vascular long water. Now let's look at the lungs, and then you see inner abdominal pressure of 15, of 30, and the development and changes over time. And this is not only true for the organ lung, but it's also true for the renal system, for the, renals, for, for the kidneys, it's true for the liver, and it's also true for the gut. So we learned from this study from Luciano Gattinoni that obviously we have two different kinds, let's say, of <coughs> um, acute lung failures we can describe, and one is obviously closely linked to changes in the interabdominal pressure. We call it pulmonary and extrapulmonary IRDS. I'm not sure if these are real entities. Maybe they just describe changes of respiratory mechanics caused by changes, for example, in the interabdominal pressure. I don't know. Anyway, what we know from this study that obviously there is a close relationship between increase of interabdominal pressure and changes of chest wall elastics. So if intra-abdominal pressure increases, chest wall elastins as increases as well. So and this has a large impact. We again compare now, don't talk about pulmonary and extra-pulmonary. We should talk about RDS with changes in chest wall compliance or elastins and changes in lung compliance or elastins. This is, might be the better term. So if we look now in a pulmonary RDS, so which means the lung is the, 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 the most problem with regard to being the resistor of the driving force of respiration, you can see if you increase PEEP, there is nearly no reaction with, with regard to the volume that can be applied or to the compliance. And as you can see, there is even a decrease of compliance if you go with your, um, <coughs> with your PEEP level above a PEEP level of 12. However, if you look at the problem when only the chest wall or mostly the chest wall is the main, uh, res um, th the main resistor in the system, you get with every step an improvement of pulmonary compliance. And once again, if you, do, uh, <coughs> if you look where, it, where this is partial to, you can just see pulmonary, so the lung is the main resistor. And if you look for uh, extra pulmonary, chest wall becomes a more and more important resistor in the system. So once again, just for repetition, for those of you who are not familiar with compliance or, resist, uh, uh, compliance or elastins, the normal situation is that most of the elastins is caused by lung elastins. So and just to describe, Elastins describe the power or your force, the force you need to press one liter of volume into a lung. And the resistor might be the lung, so the chest wall is soft, or the resistor might be, as in this case, mostly the thorax wall, the, because the thorax wall is stiff. Though a larger part of the driving force is taken by the thorax wall or by the chest wall. And this has impact on values you have seen before. So Manu Malbrain imp impressively showed that there is a quite good relationship of lower inflection point of intra-abdominal pressure if you look in all earlier RDS patients. But this is not closely linked if you just look at primary RDS. Why? Because there is no change in chest wall elastins. So now I bother you again with this data I presented yesterday. So we have been interested in this by studying healthy lungs and looking for the effects of increased intra-abdominal pressure. And as you can see, you need more or less double pressure, airway pressure. This is not transpulmonary pressure, this is airway pressure. Double airway pressure to get the same resul result with regard to recruitment in a pig model. So, and again, these are the pictures you have seen yesterday. If you now combine a first injury, oleic acid injury, with an increase in intra-abdominal pressure, as you can see here, even while applying a pressure, an airway pressure of 40, you get no recruitment in the lungs. And the reason for that is because an increase in chest wall elastins means a marked reduction in transpulmonary pressure. 
So the driving force to open up lung region is markedly reduced. So an, again, there is another observation. If you look at the edema formation, when, while increasing intra-abdominal pressure after oleic acid injury, you get a marked increase if you look in the ventral dorsal direction as well as if you look in the cephalocaudal direction. So there is a marked increase of intra-abdominal edema formation if you increase intra-abdominal pressure after first heat injury to the lungs, which was caused in this case by oleic acid injury. So this is again a proof. There's are the four studies. Let's say it's three studies, but four, st uh, four states available where we can look at the, the <coughs> um, at the compliance um, with increased interabdominal pressure. So this means baseline. This means interabdominal hypertension. Malbrain found a reduction in compliance. We found a reduction in compliance, as I have showed you, in normal, not injured lung lungs, as well as in injured lungs and the same was found by the group of Marco Ranieri. So sometimes, as we learned the last day, and we learned for sure several times this day, it's worthwhile to look back in old publications. This is a very, very nicely performed study by Joran Hedenstieler's group and Claes Forstel. And they were looking in a dog model how the lungs get rid of fluid. And there are three ways that can be described via the lung healers, transpleural or transabdominal. So, and this is also from this group. And if you f take the time together with me, thoracic lymph flow was found to be 6.1 before and 20 point to 29 after induction of lung damage with oleic acid injury. Thoracic lymph flow was depressed by 50% before and after when applying positive and expiratory pressure. Why? Because fluid drainage via the hilus and via the pleural space is markedly reduced if you increase intrathoracic pressure. So this suggests impeded drainage of the lung tissue, spontaneous breathing, we are talking now about 1987, spontaneous breathing compared to mechanical ventilation significantly increased thoracic lymph flow by about 70%. And now abdominal lymph flow increased from 60 to 100. It nearly doubled because this was the only way to get rid of the fluid. In this case, the abdominal pressure was not increased. So now let's go back to clinical practice. This is a study you have seen yesterday as well. This is a study by Salvatore Gasso and I don't want to reflect or to think about or to philosophy about recruitment maneuvers. I just would like to take this study to demonstrate how chest wall compliance influences what we are doing. So we know from this study there are recruiters and non-recruiters. The, the recruiters are normally fewer days ventilated. So we are with regards to the PAO2, FIO2 index, but now have a careful look at this one. So if you do a recruitment, there is no change in the non-recruiters of lung elastins. There is a change of lung elastins in those who are recruiters. This means there is no change probably in total respiratory system elastins. And this means whatever pressure you apply, you increase markedly intrathoracic pressure. So now look what happens with cardiac output during the applica application of recruitment. Responders, 10, 10, 10. Non-responders, 10, recruitment maneuver, 6.1. After recruitment, again, 10. So this is a marked proof that this recruitment maneuver led it in these patients to a marked increase of the interthoracic pressure. So now if we talk about intraabdominal pressure, so what is the right position to measure intraabdominal pressure and what does this mean with regards to the pulmonary compliance? So if you look for supine position, anti trendelenburg position, trendelenburg position, upright and total, you find that there is a marked difference in the intraabdominal pressure measured. However, 
the influence on the pulmonary compliance is consistently the same. So now again, ERP should be expressed, and I was happy and unhappy at the same time by this definition, because it should be expressed in millimeters of mercury. This is nice if you think of defining abdominal pressure as something which gives you an idea of abdominal perfusion pressure, because perfusion is always given in millimeters of mercury. But however, if we talk about interaction with the lungs, we are used normally to give all our values in centimeters of water. So I was not sure what is the right definition. Anyway, it was decided by the group. You can see here, so it's, it's decided to give it in millimeters of mercury. And uh, there are ways to do it intermittently, and there are ways to do it continuously. I strictly argue in special cases. I don't argue that every patient should get an abdominal pressure measurement, but if you talk about um, I, I strictly argue to use whenever possible continuous methods and the reason is it's no snapshot, it's more accurate, it can be totally automatized, it has a higher reproducibility, this is a difficult word in the morning, um, <coughs> and no inter or intra observer variability and in fact it le leads to an earlier detection of changes and allows you probably earlier to intervene. So if you use an intermittent system, I personally, I personally, I don't want to um, bother you with this, this system because it allows you just by turning a knob to have urine drainage or to go to a measurement period. This is a very easy system, easy to handle. It's well understood and well used by the nurses. It's an allergen system. You don't need a special, um, a special monitor. You can just use your normal monitoring unit. If we go, go for a continuous measurement, we're actually using two techniques, a modified Spiegelberg. Spiegelberg was once famous, and they are still now, for intracranial pressure measurements, but now they developed another probe which allows you to continuously measure intra-abdominal pressure, and you get such nice, nice readings. And the advantage of such a system while using it, you see there is a ba the, the balloon of the system, and normally, the balloon, if you once have filled it up with air, it loses air over time. But the system keeps continuously the same pressure in the balloon. So it keeps con constantly air in the balloon, so they get, get all the time um, valuable values. And there's something going along, which will probably be available around next March, the Brussels meeting. This is a new monitoring system. We have already worked with some prototypes of the probes for it, which gives you, and it's called compartment intrathoracic intraabdominal monitoring system. It gives you the intraabdominal pressure and the intrathoracic pressure, and derive from that the transdiaphragmatic pressure, which is probably the most important thing if you use intraabdominal pressure as an additional information to make your, and there's nothing more, to make your decision how to set the ventilator. And if we just look at this point, um, at least to avoid basal atelectasis, your transdiaphragmatic pressure should be above zero. If it's below zero, you get atelectasis. And you calculate it by using the <coughs> intrathoracic pressure minus the intraabdominal pressure. And this should always give you a value above zero. So, I would like to close my talk by just summarizing a critically increased intraabdominal pressure, or as you now have learned, as we call it, intraabdominal hypertension. Markedly increases chest wall elastance. It reduces, therefore, markedly as well transpulmonary pressures. It causes a massive increase of excess tissue mass or edema. And the important information we got as well from our study. This might reduce, this might induce these changes in a very short period of time. So it didn't take two or three hours. It was an observation, the increase, the massive increase of edema, which occurred within the first 20 minutes. I thank you very much for your interest. <laughs>